So um, Quentin also is a PhD student in, uh, in Dr. Panda's group uh, at the NOW Lab. And uh, he has a little bit different focus in what he's been doing, and it'll be very much uh, uh, like, the, like the topic of his talk. He really is interested in that intersection of deep learning and high performance computing and how you know high performance uh, networks can you know can do things that are helpful to um, you know to deep learning so the the title of the paper is demystifying the communication characteristics for distributed transformer models all the students are from or all I should say all the authors are from Ohio State University as as well so Quentin um, Feel free to take it away. Great, thanks a ton for the <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks a ton for the intro, Craig. So, uh, as you mentioned, I'm from Ohio State University. All of my work is with Dr. Uh, D.K. Panda, and today I'll be talking about sort of the um, how to model the communication characteristics of distributed transform models that power a lot of these LLMs that we uh, that we work with today. So let's see here. Uh, so first, I'll give a little introduction. Why do we even care about communication of transform models? Um, so to talk about trans, uh, communication specifically, I need to say why these models are large enough that they need to be distributed on an HPC system. So going back from the uh, GPT-3 paper by uh, Brown et al., uh, they found that larger models absorb more information about a given data set. So just by increasing the size of your model, by adding more parameters, um, you can actually have much significantly lower validation loss uh, at the end of training with no other fancy techniques, just make the, the model larger on the same data set. Um, this improved validation accuracy kind of comes in two different flavors. So you either have like a linear task improvement. So just linearly by increasing the number of parameters, you get a linear increase in accuracy on some tasks. Like for example, trivia question answering is linear. And then there are also tasks where you have sort of like emergence after a specific model scale. So you need something like 13 billion parameters or more in order to sort of understand uh, a few shot arithmetic. Um, and with th these two properties together, uh, everyone since then has been trying to sort of squeeze out as much performance as possible on as many parameters as possible. And more parameters means more data and uh, more parameters means uh, more GPUs in order to actually train them on all that data. Um, then the Llama paper came afterwards, uh, after Brown et al, and said, okay, you need a lot of data to saturate these ginormous models. Um, so that leads us to HPC systems. Um, so here, uh, sort of the, the, the gift and curse of these massive models is that uh, the growth rate of model parameters has far outpaced GPU VRAM. So there's not enough memory to store all of these parameters. What should one do if they were to have something like a GPT-3 model with almost 200 billion parameters, which would require a total like aggregate VRAM of two, of two terabytes when the uh, most expensive accelerators today from like NVIDIA, for example, are something like 80, um, whereas H200s uh, are not really increasing by an order of magnitude. It's a much, much slower rate of increase compared to the number of parameters. Um, GPT-4 has like 1.8 trillion parameters and these mixture of expert models that are coming out uh, just have far too many parameters to store on any single accelerator today. Um, most of these frontier models are transformer based, so we'll be focusing on that specific architecture today. Um, and as I said before, these massive models require massive data sets in order to saturate all of those parameters. Um, those massive models and data sets require parallelism because of the memory bottleneck that I was mentioning before. So you need to have a lot of aggregate memory on a lot of different GPUs in order to actually just train the thing. Um, you split the model parameters themselves across GPUs via model parallelism, which we'll get into in more detail later on. And then uh, you split the data set batches across GPUs via data parallelism. Another thing, another sort of a paradigm we'll be getting into later on. Um, all of this parallelism requires a lot of GPU to GPU communication all of this with the uh, GPU direct RDMA specifically. And we really want to understand and reduce this overhead um, because any time that you spend communicating during a training run is time that is not spent on uh, actually computing the update to the model that leads to uh, this improved task accuracy. Um, so now some more motivation on why we want to do this. Uh, so we took a look at a 13 billion parameter GPT based model and a 20 billion parameter model. And we uh, tested both of these on Frontier. So these proportions of compu computation to communication are not like inherent to these specific models, but they're real world examples with uh, real world uh, configurations that show that communication can take very quickly take the majority of your uh, iteration time. 
Um, so something like 80% uh, spent in communication is uh, something that people probably wouldn't deploy on an actual system, but uh, before tuning or anything else, this is very common to see. Um, uh, one thing to note here is that when you scale to more and more GPUs with these sort of um, models, uh, for example, here we scale from one node to 64 nodes with 512 uh, AMD GPUs at the peak. Uh, while you reduce the per GPU computation, so for example, if it's data parallelism, um, each GPU will have to see fewer batches overall, which is a good thing. It also increases the overall communication. So in data parallelism, again, uh, when you have more GPUs, more GPUs have to communicate this average gradient now. Um, and this ends up catching up to you very quickly and you'll spend most of your time uh, not making progress towards your goal. OK, so our proposed solution, or at least proposed um, sort of process in order to understand this overhead, uh, and then we can you know, go about actually reducing it, is to do an in-depth analysis of communication behavior of transformer-based LLMs on HPC systems. Uh, so we kind of approach this from two different ways. So one on the theory side, we tried to develop like an analytical model that covers a variety of different parallelism schemes, both data and model, and different flavors of model parallelism. And we account for the model size, the sequence length, like the, the training sequence length that each sample is composed of, and different parallelism optimizations. Then on the experimental side, we say, okay, so now we have this analytical model. How does this actually apply to some real world systems? So like Frontier at Oak Ridge is where we uh, performed all of our experiments. It's a very specific system with a very specific interconnect. Um, is different interconnects across nodes and within nodes, and the AMD GPUs themselves are a challenge. So just sort of seeing what does a real world example of this look like, and uh, what are some um, sort of portions of training that we can do much better on. Um, so uh, there's a lot of challenges when one profiles because there's so many moving parts. The software stack is very deep uh, when you're doing transformer training. So you need to look at uh, these different architectures. We tend to focus on um, decoder only transformers, specifically GPT for this paper, but most of our analysis can be applied pretty easily to vision transformers or T5 or encoder decoder based. Um, then we choose a uh, distributed deep learning frameworks. So we use both Megatron and DeepSpeed um, for different parallelism schemes. How do these interact with the deep learning frameworks underneath, which is PyTorch for us? And then, of course, the communication middleware uh, is a very important step here. And then um, how is this actually implemented on the HPC platform for us, Oak Ridge Frontier? OK, so a bit of background just to get everyone up to speed on the sort of language I'm using. Uh, one moment here. OK. Um, what is GPT? So GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So it was really, I would say, popularized and kind of took off with that uh, GPT-3 paper that I discussed earlier by Brown around 2020. Um, so what are these? Where are these actual parameters being allocated in the model so that we can actually, you know, derive this analytical model? Um, so you have an input token embedding um, at the very start. Uh, then you have a positional encoding afterwards. So like where do the tokens land in the sequence itself? And then we have N transformer blocks or layers. Um, and each of these contain a self-attention block. So we have multiple heads of attention that each themselves perform a self-attention uh, kernel. Uh, then we have a single um, multi-layer perceptron block, which is just like um, a fully connected layer uh, or a set of two fully connected uh, linears specifically. And then you have a non-linear activation function right after that feed forward. <gasps> Excuse me. And at the very end of your model, you just have a final uh, output unembedding and a final layer norm. Uh, so very simple model, uh, very vanilla uh, LLM transformer. Um, let's see here. So now on to parallelism techniques. Uh, one moment. OK, yeah. So data parallelism is the most simple um, sort of scheme. So in data parallelism, we have the entire model uh, end to end is duplicated on every single GPU. So if you have eight GPUs, all eight of those GPUs contain the exact same model parameters. Um, then you split each mini batch of data. So each one of those different GPUs um, gets its own uh, unique piece of data. It's a unique batch. Uh, each batch contains some number of sequences. And um, then all of those uh, do forward and backward passes and populate local gradients. And then you communicate and average those gradients using an all-reduce operation. Um, after the all-reduce operation, you have like a global gradient. And then all of these uh, individual GPUs apply the global gradient to get the new global set of parameters. And you do this sort of like lockstep training process where um, all of the GPUs always contain um, the same weights after the, they uh, average the gradients. For our purposes, what we care about is that uh, this is an expensive all-reduce operation, um, which we'll get into more later. But what if that model doesn't fit on the GPU? Remember, we had this GPT-3 model that takes something like two terabytes of VRAM, uh, which is just infeasible. Um, so then you have very specific transformer-based um, parallelism schemes. So first is pipeline parallelism, which distributes model layers across GPUs. So if you have eight layers and eight GPUs, a very simple uh, pipeline scheme would just be that you have um, 
one layer pGPU, and then you do the forward pass to the first GPU, you communicate with point to point uh, the activation for that layer to the GPU two, and then so on, uh, all the way through the forward pass, and then you do gradients in the backward pass. So it's just sort of, um, one can think that uh, only one GPU is, is active at a time, so it's not really a great concurrency um, scheme. If you just do like the basic one layer per GPU scheme, um, people tend to split up batches into micro batches, which we might get into a bit later. Um, but the gist here is that pipeline parallelism it, it is simple and that it's uh, at the granularity of just a few layers, um, but it's bad in terms of concurrency and you need really high batch sizes to, to sort of squeeze those bubbles, the idle time bubbles. Um, lastly, this tensor parallelism. So um, uh, generalized matrix matrix ops uh, can be parallelized. Those uh, MLPs, the multi-layer perceptrons that are fully connected are really easy to split up into sub matrices. And then each GPU performs its sub matrix of, um, of the forward and backward passes, uh, and then you partition the compute along the rows and the columns of those MLPs. So the current state of the art uh, distributes MLP and self-attention blocks, um, like with an all aggregated all reduce and, and all gather. Um, and then these all reduces and all gathers you need to do, um, I think if I recall correctly, I think it's on a future slide, but I think it's six all reduces or all gathers um, in, a, in uh, each training iteration. And this is, requires so much volume that you are limited to a single node. Um, but we'll get into all that detail in a bit. Um, so what's better than one parallelism strategy? Uh, all of them at once, because these different parallelism strategies have different trade-offs. Um, it's best to find a, a specific training topology that best uh, maximizes your throughput. So this leads me to 3D parallelism, where the three Ds are um, data parallelism, pipeline parallelism, and tensor parallelism, the three dimensions. Um, and then from those, we get a 3D mesh, um, which is uh, sort of what we can see in this figure a bit. So you ha would have two pipeline stages, each containing some number of layers. And those layers themselves are split up via the um, matrix matrix, like sharding of tensor parallelism. Um, let's see here. So we don't do a whole lot of 3D parallelism specific um, experiments in this paper, um, but we do include some analysis for completeness. Okay, so this leads me to the zero redundancy optimizer from the Deep Speed team at Microsoft. Um, so it's initially designed to kind of be a better mousetrap for data parallelism. So instead of your baseline data parallelism, where every GPU gets the full set of the same parameters, uh, identical gradients, identical, or sorry, um, their own co full copy of, of the parameters, and then their local gradients, and then their local optimizer states, we instead say, okay, only store um, the specific shard of the optimizer state in the zero stage one of our given GPU. So zero has three stages. In the first one, you shard the optimizer states. In the second stage, you also shard the gradients. And then the third stage, you also shard the parameters. So it's sort of like a quasi data parallel um, model parallel scheme in like the zero three case. Um, importantly for us in terms of communication volume, uh, zero, one, and two just split the all reduce of data parallelism into two separate steps of reduce scatter and all gather. Um, and since uh, splitting an all reduce into reduce scatter and all gather is the same communication volume, you can get away with sort of a free lunch on zero, one, zero, two. Um, the only added um, complexity is, is code complexity and then perhaps some reduced overlap. A zero, three, however, requires an additional all gather operation. And that is because the parameters themselves are sharded across GPUs, so you can't do a full forward or backward pass. So um, zero three is not a free lunch. You have this extra um, all gather leading to a 1.5x communication volume. Um, lastly, just for completeness, uh, zero plus plus is sort of a hybrid strategy where you do like zero three with the extra all gather within a single node. And that way the communication volume is under a much higher like bandwidth uh, interconnect like NVLink. Um, and then you do zero two or something across nodes. Um, we don't analyze it in this paper. For us, all you should think about is zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so this leads me to the performance model that we developed. It's sort of an analytical model to sort of, um, before you start training, say, does this topology that I want to train with that fits my model, is it actually going to give um, amenable communication characteristics? Um, okay, so we use as a basis uh, a GPT Neo X model architecture, which is just a decoder only GPT model, similar to what I was discussing earlier. Um, first, before you can do any volume, you first need to just calculate how many parameters do I have based on the hyperparameters that I choose. Hyperparameters being things like the sequence length, the hint dimension, and I have a table here that says, okay, uh, what, what all these different um, uh, uh, symbols actually mean to me. So uh, the vocab size, for example, the tensor parallel size is the number of GPUs, for example, that you split via tensor parallelism and so on. Um, so as I'm uh, 
think back a bit to the actual transformer architecture that I uh, provided previously, where you have like the position encodings and embeddings, and then you have n blocks, and then at the very end you have an unembedding. So the embedding and unembedding are each uh, of size vh, so total two vh for the embeddings and unembeddings. Um, then you have sh for the positional encodings, like where each token lands in the sequence, um, and then you have l layers each of them containing 12 H squared, um, which if people are interested in like the nitty gritty details uh, boils down to the attention matrices, uh, the MLP with two spe uh, specific layers, uh, linears. And then finally, each layer has a layer norm. And then you have a final layer norm at the end of the model. Um, so this is how you calculate the number of parameters. And then once we're on the same page, you can actually start saying, okay, there's actually a very simple um, a formulation here of the communication volume that you can derive. Uh, so for data parallelism, and zero, one, and two. Remember, I said zero, one, and two are sort of a free lunch because you just have all gather, reduce, scatter instead of the all reduce. Uh, in all those cases, it's just two times the param count times the number of GPUs minus one over uh, number of GPUs. And this is because it's the all reduce communication volume. Nothing really exotic here. Um, I would say here that um, specifically the uh, every single parameter we're assuming in this work has an individual gradient, uh, which is why this is param count. If some parameters don't have gradients, like in the fine tuning case, where maybe if you have like a specific layer is like a, a frozen parameters and you're not updating them, this param count would be lower and you could have some custom formulation for it. Um, and then further, so as I mentioned, 0, 3 has this extra all gather present uh, for the parameters, uh, which I'm showing here again for completeness. Um, we have this extra m times number of GPUs minus one over number of GPUs. So then we get a three times the parameter count. Um, pretty straightforward. Let's see here, one moment. OK, this leads me to pipeline parallelism and tensor parallelism. So both of these equations are um, assuming that you're not using any other parallelism scheme, just to be clear. So uh, for pipeline parallelism, you have a, a volume of 2 BSH times P minus 1, where P is the number of pipeline stages. So uh, for like this example here, um, there would be three pipeline stages because you have th three layers and three G split across three GPUs. Um, and then you need to send activations in the forward pass from one to two and two to three, uh, so P minus one. Uh, and then each one of those messages is of size BSH, where B is the batch size, S is the sequence length, and H is the hidden dimension. Uh, and then two, because you have the forward and the backward pass. So purely point-to-point -point communication volume. Um, and then for tensor parallelism, uh, as I, yeah, I mentioned previously, so six all reduces per layer uh, across TP ranks, and that's two each for the forward, backward, and activation recomputation. Where activation recomputation is when um, you save, you do like a trade-off of additional um, compute for reduced memory overhead, where you sort of uh, forget some of the intermediate activations and then later recompute them so that you don't have to store them in VRAM. And when you have to recompute them, you also have to recommunicate them, leading to a higher uh, communication volume. So this is where this six comes from. Um, but total, uh, each one of those messages is again of size BSH. Um, and then the split across uh, T um, GPUs, where T is the degree of tensor parallelism, and it's an all reduce. So the total is uh, 12L plus two. Um, this plus two at the very end is this additional all reduce at embeddings. Because the vocab uh, at the embedding and unembedding are also split with tensor parallelism. Okay, this leads me into the experiments themselves. Um, so as I mentioned before, we did everything on the uh, Frontier su supercomputer at Oak Ridge. Um, so these contain uh, four MI250X GPUs. One specific caveat uh, that people should be aware of here is that there are two GCDs per GPU. So there are two compute dies on every single GPU, uh, which is two logical ranks. So a single GPU contains two logical ranks and they communicate via MPI or whatever other communication library we're using. Um, similar to like a DGX box, there is there are separate um, interconnects within the node compared to across nodes. So within the node um, with AMD, they have AMD Infinity Fabric. And for those familiar, this is basically just an MVLink. link. Um, one added caveat is that since those two logical um, dies within a GPU themselves have um, the highest bandwidth interconnect. So now you have a three level topology instead of like a standard two level topology one would have on like an NVIDIA system where you have the fastest bandwidth across uh, GCDs on a GPU, uh, a slightly slower but still high bandwidth interconnect across GPUs within the node, and then a much slower um, internode interconnect, which is in our case, Slingshot, um, 
and the, uh, the slingshot interconnect across node differs by like an order of magnitude uh, to the bandwidth of the intranode interconnect. Um, we use a pretty standard uh, distributed deep learning uh, um, software stack where at the top we have GPT Neo X, which is our like Megatron deep speed based um, uh, framework that's built on top of deep speed and PyTorch. We use a very simple like dummy data set of NWIC 8. Um, and then the model sizes we use range from 19 million parameters all the way up to 13 billion. All these model parameters, or uh, sorry, all these models, by the way, are just vanilla LLMs, uh, vanilla GPT de decoder only models. Uh, so everything that I've described previously applies to these specific models. Okay, um, so distributed data parallelism and zero experiments. Uh, what, what does the actual data show? So the uh, 19 million through 13 billion parameter models, um, all of them have the expected. So if you recall, um, excuse me, um, we, we split for zero the data parallel all reduce into independent steps of reduce scatter and all gather. And each of those has the same communication volume. So this is experimental data just verifying, yep, for zero one, for zero two, uh, you equally split your communication volume between the reduce, uh, reduce scatter and the all gather. Uh, and then if you have zero three, you have an extra all gather, meaning you get like a 66% or thereabouts um, overhead for the all gather specifically for the extra parameter all gather. So this um, perfectly matches the performance model, nothing significantly uh, shocking here. So we can move forward. Um, we also wanted to look at the like the breakdown of communication in, in bytes. Uh, and we see that like the increase in the model size correlates with um, the formulas on volume between the, all, all three zero stages. So whether you um, are tracking your communication volume in, in bytes or a number of elements or whatever else, um, they match with the expected um, uh, uh, analytical uh, formulas that we provided previously. So zero three is where things get a little interesting. So this extra all gather, uh, what does it look like? So it's actually a lot of little all gathers in practice uh, was one thing that we sort of drew a lot of attention to. Those little all gathers are all in buckets and we each bucket is contains like a fused set of parameter uh, of parameters in the model. And you sort of, you have this fused set so that you can have computation and communication overlap where you sort of do uh, the computation of a few parameters or a few layers that is, um, and then you add those to the bucket of zero three, you communicate and all gather in the background while you're uh, computing the next bucket. Um, but in practice, this sort of scheme of flip-flopping between filling buckets and communicating them is that you have a lot of very small um, message sizes for your all gather, which is counter to what most communication libraries are optimized for. So most uh, deep learning communication libraries on GPUs are optimized for very large messages. And this is counter to this uh, sort of intuition. Um, so for those looking to, uh, like for example, us on MPI developers, uh, this is like an interesting finding that is important for us to still pay attention to those small messages, uh, small messages in the all gather. Um, Okay, and spe specifically the non-blocking altogether. Um, so we found some mild underestimates at all scales. Uh, so we, this doesn't uh, bother us too much. Really just the performance model assumes no extra messages besides like the required messages for the parallelism schemes. So within maybe one to 5%, we, we uh, tend to us underestimate uh, the actual communication volume. And this extra one to 5% is usually things like intermediate messages or logging messages. Um, Deep speed has some internals where um, things besides the actual parameters themselves are communicated. Uh, so we count those from like our logger of communication, but we don't account for those in the, in the formula. So that, that's just an explanation of why we tend to underestimate very slightly. Um, let's see, so we had an out of memory on the 13B parameter model uh, here. If you just use pure data parallelism, recall from previously that I said that in pure data parallelism, you have to store the entire model weights, entire gradients and the entire optimizer states on every GPU. And uh, you have, you end up with very strict limits on what sort of model size you can fit. Whereas zero um, does a pretty good job of splitting those um, three classes of training memory across all of the GPUs. So that instead of being limited by a single GPU's VRAM, excuse me, you're instead limited by um, the aggregate uh, GPU memory of your system. Okay, um, but uh, if nothing else, these are just to show that even in practice, uh, the communication, the simple communication uh, model that we provided earlier uh, tends to match performance and you can use it to determine um, what volume is uh, amenable to your system and your setup.
Okay, this leads me to tensor parallelism. So remember I told you before that tensor parallelism is really expensive. So um, there are six all reduces every single iteration, uh, each of them with a fairly large uh, message sizes, which we'll get into. Um, communication volume is impacted uh, greatly by just the hidden layer count specifically. Uh, the proportion of the all reduced to all gather stays really consistent when increasing model size. Um, if nothing else, you should know that tensor parallelism uses a lot of large message all reduce specifically, um, a huge amount of communication volume per iteration. Uh, the 125M specifically, as a side note, it fails with pure tensor parallelism just because, <clears throat> excuse me, remember I mentioned previously that tensor parallelism splits um, the uh, multi-layer perceptrons into submatrices. Um, one other detail here is that it also splits the attention blocks by the attention heads. And that the 125 million parameter model specifically, uh, just as a side note, did not have a number of attention heads that were divisible by the tensor parallel degrees that we were looking at. Uh, therefore, it just wasn't able to, like there's no sort of um, um, like trailing attention heads that tensor parallel, parallelism counts for. So we weren't able to, to account for it or to model the 125M. Um, in any case, tensor parallelism, if no other takeaway, it's a lot of communication volume. It's all in all ruse. Um, pipeline parallelism, so has an emphasis on these point-to-point -point communications that I mentioned before, where in the forward pass, you're sending activations, in the backward pass, you're sending gradients. Um, what's not shown here is there's some all reduces that we saw with pipeline, but these are specific to deep speed itself. So these are just deep speed internals, just mostly for uh, bookkeeping that we saw um, and things like keeping track of the data loader and things. Um, so we didn't include those in these graphs, but the send operations contain uh, an extra few megabytes, which we think is just sending metadata on behalf of each sending rank. Um, other than that, uh, these align pretty much perfectly uh, with the analytical model that I showed before, which we'll see in a moment. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, this is in a moment now. So uh, we compared these empirical results to the analytical model that I discussed previously uh, so similar to data parallelism in 0, 1, 2, and 3, the measured volume matches our estimate. Uh, in most cases, there's some small deviations of a few percent, as I said before, for deep speed internals. Um, as a side note, we did take a look at sequence length and its impacts. Uh, as a case study, we looked at the 1.3 billion parameter model. Um, as your sequence length increases, um, <clears throat> that BSH in both the tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism cases, um, yeah, so you have like a linear impact of sequence length on the communication volume, which we also see in each of our uh, pipeline and tensor parallel, um, like 3D topologies, sequence length increases your message size uh, linearly. Um, and then for zero, one, two, and three, since you're not actually communicating sequences, uh, no matter what your sequence length is, uh, you have a fixed communication volume for any of those schemes. Um, then, uh, so the larger sequence length you have, as a quick aside, the more efficient um, your, the underlying kernels are. So higher sequence lengths are also um, <clears throat> good for uh, throughput. So this leads me to my conclusions. Um, so we presented an in-depth characterization of LLM communication volumes, specifically for decoder-only transformers and their behavior on Oak Ridge Frontier. So this requires rigorous modeling, uh, which we performed, uh, and then we actively choose what stack to profile um, requires some system knowledge if library ports are required and some uh, good choices of state-of-the-art frameworks. But we tried to do something that was representative of the most common uh, LM training regime. Go ahead. Okay, Quinn, uh, thanks. That's that's very impressive how you were able to uh, do such a, a good job of predicting the performance, especially when you've got such complexity that's, that's hard to achieve. Um, let's see, I'm... Just going to check the Slack channel. Looks like we have a couple of questions that have just come in. First, uh, from Mike Cupano. I don't know if I pronounced that right. But do you have data on the percentage of average time GPU nodes on Oak Ridge's Frontier sit idle, waiting for a collective communication library for a complete training run uh, for your uh, 13B model? Alternately, the percentage utilization of the GPUs, does does your model predict this on any cluster of size? Yeah, so we don't have results on this. So this is determined by if your model has enough compute to overlap. Overlap is really hard to predict in practice. Um, so our utilizations were, were pretty high. We were pretty close on the smaller models, especially to like the max achievable TFLOPs 
of the MI250X, which is in the paper. I don't remember off the top of my head, but the actual overlap we did not measure and we did not model. Thank you. And Pankaj has a question again for this talk. Um, what data set did you use for sequence length impact? What were the largest sequences that you considered? We took a look at um, sequence lengths uh, up to 4K, so 4096. We used the NWIC, so just Wikipedia data for all of these. And that didn't come into the equation like the choice of data set because we weren't looking at the model like behaviors themselves. We weren't looking at like needle in a haystack or long context modeling performance of the model. We just wanted to see the actual throughput. Yep, up to 4K. Very good, thanks. And Sai Chana has a question. Did you have to set use underscore multi-rank underscore all reduce to false to collect the reduced message sizes for deep speed zero stage one and two? Um, default mm -hmm. behavior does all reduce instead of default behavior does all reduce instead of reduce scatter as part of the optimization. Yes, yes. So we did face this and we did have to force the reduce scatter all gather implementation within deep speed. Yeah. I don't know if we use that specific flag, but we did force that code path. Great. Thanks. And if there are any other questions, uh, um, uh, please post them really quick or or you can post them over time and Quentin will go back and look later. Um, so from a perspective of system design, both hardware and software, um, with what you've learned here, where would you tell you know system designers um, or or software library library designers like MVAP and Vapitch people to spend their time on you know which which of the collective calls do you think uh, is the is the one to really try to bang on first to help you help you out and in, in for yeah. deep learning? Well, broadly, non-blocking GPU aware collectives are all of these fall under that umbrella uh, point to point as well, but non-blocking is something that I think <clears throat> MPI people don't spend as much time on uh, as they should for deep learning. The second is that all reduce and specifically the reduction kernels uh, within that all reduce are really important for deep learning. Um, so I put a lot of my attention there on all reduce for large messages, large messages especially. And if I know for a fact that, for example, I'm using zero three, 3 uh, I would do like small message all gathers as well. But Non-blocking, all reduce for large messages is by and large the most expensive operation in these. And if you're looking at small message all gather, you start to think about some aggregation techniques like the first talk, I suppose, at that point. So. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just double check to make sure there are no more questions. I don't see any. Um, so uh, thanks, Quentin. Thanks to both of you for you know just fantastic talks, fantastic work. Um, this is the end of this session. Um, I believe that we will see um, posted by the, um, you know, someone in the conference administration. I think there's going to be a um, um, sort of, some sort of a, a, a nice video from Nutanix next. I don't know if that happens in this session or if it happens somehow otherwise, but, um, but that's what's, and then of course we have a break immediately after that as well. So that's what's coming next. Thank you everybody. And thanks again, Quentin. Virtual round of applause again. So thanks all. Thanks.